Hi, I'm Eileen Roach, founder of Designs of Machine Embroidery, and thank you for joining me here today. I am so excited about today's topic, quilting with your embroidery machine. That's a topic that is so dear to my heart. I've been, you know, the very first issue of Designs of Machine Embroidery magazine featured a quilt that was all embroidered and quilted in an embroidery machine on its cover. And that's a long time ago, 1999, right? And boy, have we come a long way. But not only are we gonna talk about quilting with your embroidery machine, it's also the November door reveal. And I know many of you are tuning in for that. Um, and I see lots of comments. Let's see, Crystal Campbell, you're so excited about this. You have uh, contemplated uh, purchasing these items. So I think you, today's um, program will really kind of clear up some questions that you may have had. How doable is this really? And what do you need to have success? So um, I have some great tips for you to do that. And let's see, uh, who else is there? Will there be, uh, oh, I know. And Retha, you are making more masks and you're using a new pattern. Good for you. That's fun, right? Um, and dreary in New York, uh, you know, dreary here in Texas too. We've had a lot of rain and cold here this week, which is not, you know, the right temperature for our season. So anyway. We're do, you know, we'll get through it, right? Oh, if you hear somebody from Minnesota, I shouldn't whine, you know, it's 30 degrees here. And, you know, I'm sure it might be a little different in Minnesota. So, oh, Michelle calling in from South Africa. Welcome. Thank you for joining us from across the pond. And Judy Warren, hello to you. It's so great. Um, let's see. And Carol Lombard, you say you don't always. Um, you don't always sew straight, but your machine does. Isn't that the truth? These machines are a dream. Oh my. Let's see. Oh, and Risa, you're in Wyoming, negative nine. Ah, A. McCarthy. There's our A. McCarthy. She was here with me last week. Remember everyone? And she's saying she loves my earrings. She showed these last week in purple. They were super fun. So, well, it looks like the crowd's growing. So, I want to know how many of you are making the doors and how many have you completed? Have you done all 10? And if not, no judgment, no judgment at all. I just want to know that you're enjoying these making, you know, some of them or all of them. So let us know in the comments how many you have made. Okay. Oh, but Charlene, we're going to put her up there because it's 85 in South Carolina. Woo woo. Good for you. That's a lovely day, right? And Sharon Schroeder, you have done all 10. Thank you. I'm so glad to hear that. That's awesome. Okay. So let's uh, take a look at those doors. I know that many of you, this is the 10 that's already completed. We're going to get number 11 at the end of today's program. And I think you're really going to like it. Um, Amy McCarthy saw it last week and she was just tickled. So let's go ahead and you know, we'll save that topic for the end of today's program because uh, we have a lot to cover beforehand. So we're gonna talk really about three different uh, elements of quilting with your embroidery machine. And that's prepping the quilt, hooping the quilt, and then handling all that, all that bulk. You know, because quilts are heavy, right? I mean, we've been making these doors, which are just six by 10 inches, which is very nice, but you know, it's small and you most certainly don't have to worry about handle, handling the bulk of that. But I've done king size, queen size, and my favorite lap size quilt is about 50 by um, 72. So, um, you know, that's a lot of quilt to handle on an embroidery machine. So what do we want to do first? Well, the first thing we want to do is Based that quilt together. And pardon me, you know, I turned my phone off and, <laughs> and yet it's ringing. So pardon me. Uh, we got that out of the way. So the first thing I do is I based my quilt and I use safety pins. You can use straight pins or um, spray basting. I don't really like to do the spray basting because I usually make my quilt sandwich indoors. So I don't want that blowing all over my house. So I use pool noodles. And, you know, you can get them in the dollar store at, you know, home, the home stores. You can also get them at pool stores. Uh, let's see. Um, somebody wants to know, how do you get the pattern for the doors? Well, Pam, we're going to have all those links available very soon towards the end of the program. So you'll be able to get all of that um, in one fell swoop. Pool noodles allow you to baste your quilt 
in small segments because you can just use a table and it does need to be the width of the quilt, but it doesn't have to be completely flat. So what the image that you're seeing on the screen right now shows the quilt backing being attached uh, to a pool noodle. And you'll notice it is wrong side up, just like you would normally make a quilt sandwich. And this is the quilt top, which is rolled onto the noodle right side up, just like you would with a regular um, quilt sandwich. Here is what it would look like as you progress the basting process. So you're going to start, you know, at the end of the quilt, and then you'll advance the fabric, releasing some of it off of the noodle and pin based. And here, this is my flower box quilt, and I am just about under, uh, just about to the edge of, you know, or the top of that quilt. So I'm just about done. So let's head over to my tabletop camera so you can take a look at how I do it. I have a table runner here so you can see how I do this. So here's the, you know, the top side, the right side of my table runner. And here's a pool noodle. And I just use straight pins. So I'll pull them out. And then I'm going to, let me get that in the camera view. I'm going to place the edge of my table runner in a straight fashion across the width of the pool noodle. Now, you could take a Sharpie and mark a straight line so that you have a reference point. That's probably a really good idea. But, you know, on a table runner, it's not really necessary. And then we're just going to, I'm just pinning that right into the pool noodle. Now, I can't feel the pin on the other side, so it's perfect. And then I'm just going to begin to roll. Now, I normally would have this all flattened out. There we go, like that. And I'm just going to roll and smooth. Now, I'll tell you, when this is big, you're going to work on one end, and you're going to smooth it, and then roll and smooth it and roll. But this works on king size, queen size. It's awesome. And then you'll just do the whole thing, right? And then we'll set that aside. And... For the back, I've already completed this one. And so you'll notice this is the back of my quilt and it's wrong side up. Here's the right side. So this is wrong side up. So in order to start pin basting, I would lay this out and then take my batting and place the edge of the batting. Oh. <laughs> oh. That was pretty fun. Okay, they are round, they do roll. Okay, so now I have my batting situated here and I smooth that um, batting in place, make sure it's you know nice and flat. And then I take my table runner top and I wanna match up those edges and most certainly you would take the necessary time to make sure all of that is nice and flat. And then we're gonna pin baste. Now, at home, I make sure I'm doing this with a cutting mat underneath so that I can just poke those pins right into the table surface and I don't have to worry about marking my table. I have this pretty nice white table here, so I don't really want to mark it by pushing that in there. And, you know, I usually do this a hands width away, so I would have another one here and another one here and, you know, and so on the whole way. And then as you release your quilt, you know, as you work the basting all the way down, you're going to do this the entire uh, length of your quilt. And then you can just pull it off of the noodle and it's all basted. You don't have to worry about it being wrinkled or, you know, any pleats or puckers in the wrong side. I love this technique. It is just phenomenal. So but I think you get the picture, right? Isn't that fun? And then, you know, once that's all done, now I'm ready to go to the machine and hoop that. Now I would do a better job. I would definitely have more pins, about five inches apart. So let me see if you have any questions. Okay. McDowell, you like that? Um, and embroidery.com, yeah, you like that pool noodle. So many things to do with them. Yeah, it, they are really, you know, I have often seen people use uh, skinny pieces of wood, 
but yeah, you know, I don't know. I think pool noodles are so easy to connect to one another. So you can have, you know, pool noodles come, I think they're like 50 inches in length. And if you're queen size quilt is 80 inches in length. You just buy four and tape them together and, you know, and they're flush and boy, that's awesome. It's just, it's great. And then I can, you can cut them apart. And I also use them to store quilts on because now you don't have any creases or folds that you have to worry about damaging the fibers of, of your quilt. You just roll them on the, on the pool noodle and it's very easy to transport. Yeah. So isn't that fun? Yeah, really fun. I know, I love that. How big is the quilt? Well, Sharon, this quilt, this is a table runner. So this is about 24 inches wide times 72. It's not very big, but the quilt that I'm going to show you on the machine is um, 60 inches, 55 inches wide by 72. So you'll see that in a minute. Um, let me see where I am here. Now we want to go back to PowerPoint, I think, because our next thing that we want to talk about is how we handle the quilt in the hoop, right? Because now, to be absolutely honest with you, I would, I've learned to not try to quilt with an embroidery machine with a standard hoop. Uh, Kathy Wink says you can join, you can put a dowel rod through to join two noodles. You can, for sure. You could do that, but boy, packing tape, one little piece, so easy. That's what I do. And then I just tear them apart if, if they're too long and I don't need them. So hoops, you know, I'm definitely go all going to be all about the monster hoop. And I always, well, I don't always use, but I suggest that you use a hoop that's po possibly the largest one for your machine. Now I'm gonna be working on the Solaris today. And the Solaris, the Baby Lock Solaris and the Brother Luminaire have a giant hoop, which is 10 and a half by 16. And frankly, it's almost so big, it's, a, it's hard to manage. So I often use the nine and a half by 14 and um, that makes it just easier to advance the fabric. And you'll, you'll see what I mean. But if you are comfortable with that 10 by 16, man, use it, it's great. It's just great. So where can you get those hoops? Well, many sewing machine retailers across America have them in their store. You most certainly can just drive over to your local dealer and they'll probably have them for you. But if not, um, you can most certainly get it on our website, dzgns.com. And I wanna kind of walk you through how you would find the hoop for your machine because we've changed our website. So first you'll just click on hoops at the top of the toolbar, and then you wanna select your machine brand. And you can see we have all the different brands here. And once you're in your brand, you then select the hoop size that you want. And you'll notice there's a, a model field underneath where you can also select your model. And when you have those, if you select a hoop, that's too large for your machine, it will be grayed out and it won't allow you to select that. So um, make sure that you um, select the right model and the right size for your machine and then just add to cart and that's how easy that is. And let's see, Matthew Fabalia wants to say, you're late. Oh, well, welcome. You're never late on Facebook. We're always happy to have you here. And you most certainly can watch later. You haven't missed that much. Well, you did miss my tip on how to baste a, a quilt in preparation for actually quilting it. So that's a great tip and technique that you'll want to learn. So you can watch the replay when this broadcast ends. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, Misha, your manufacturer makes one with just a metal base. Yeah, and kind of like refrigerator magnets, right? Not very strong. Yeah. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look and talk about the design. So now I have this giant hoop, right? Nine and a half by 14. And my quilt is probably going to need about 50 hoopings, 50 repeats of that design. This is a big job, folks, right? We have to remember, it's a big job. So Am I going to be able to nail the placement of that design in every single hooping if I select a design that is the exact same size as my hoop? Probably not. And it's gonna frustrate me and I probably won't finish my quilt. 
If you look at your pile of UFOs, unfinished objects, aren't many of them just because it wasn't pleasant to complete the project? That's what I want to erase for sure. So if you select a design that is just a little bit smaller than your hoop, you will have wiggle room, which will allow you to move the design so that you can get your precision placement without precision hooping. There's a big difference. And I'll show you what I mean in a moment. Okay, so now we want to talk about handling the bulk because isn't that the real challenge is all that weight? You know, it could be five, six, maybe 10 pounds. I mean, I don't know. I Actually, I'm making that up. I don't know how heavy most quilts are, but they're too heavy for our hoops, right? If you think about it, an embroidery machine was engineered to create to hold fabric that fills the sewing field. So a five by seven, a six by 10, that is the limit that the manufacturer guarantees will be able to be carried with the machine, you know, with the hoop as the embroidery design is stitched. But, you know, then there's us, right? Because we have a queen size quilt and we want to quilt it on our embroidery machine. Well, that manufacturer, that machine manufacturer never intended for you to do that. They kind of thought you'd go out and get a long arm for that job. But anyway, uh, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and talk about how to handle that weight. So on a table runner, I just turn the back of my chair, my sewing chair around, and I rest that excess fabric on the back of the chair. You, know, you just want to lift it so that it's not dragging all over, uh, you know, because you don't want it to drag the hoop, right? So now this is what we're normally faced with. This is a lap quilt, a jelly roll quilt, and you know this is not going to be a pretty progress, right? I, I'm just something's going to happen, I can tell you, because it's just way too much weight. It, you have a quilt back, quilt top, and batting. Much too much weight. So we need a tool that is the right tool. Like you wouldn't use a Mini Cooper to pull a beautiful 24 or 30-foot boat, right? You just wouldn't do that. It's not going to work. You need the right tool. I can, give, I can tell you that you, this is one workaround, to use an ironing board behind your machine. And it will, I suggest that you raise the height of the, of the ironing board so that it is level with your machine bed, not your sewing table. It needs to be level with the machine bed. There's a big difference. And then if you use this technique, place a piece of vinyl, like a shower curtain or this is marine vinyl and it's, you'll notice it's underneath the table and extending over that ironing board. Now that does give me a smooth kind of fluid area for my uh, quilt to travel over as the machine stitches because it's going to move. That's what it's for. Okay, but I have a, the right tool for the right job. This is what you would use if you were going to take that beautiful uh, fishing boat to the lake, right? You would need a large F-150 or some other wonderful brand. So several years ago, I invented the weightless quilter. And the weightless quilter is a floor frame that sits underneath your furniture or, be, or surrounding your furniture. And it has flex poles that hold the weight of the quilt above the machine bed. And it mimics the movement of the of the hoop. So it will actually sway as the hoop is moving because you know the hoop moves, right? Not the needle. The needle just stares, it stays here and goes up and down and the hoop moves. So let's go ahead and take a look at it in progress. So here we are over at our beautiful Solaris. And I just wanted to show you, this is the weightless quilter box. This is what it comes in. And it is uh, lightweight. I most certainly can lift it up and even over my head. It has eight different poles. These are the flex poles. And we have skinny ones and ones that are a little bit wider with diameter. And the, the very skinny ones are more flexible. So they're for lightweight quilts. 
and a smaller quilt. And then the thicker diameter is for a heavier quilt or a larger quilt, like maybe a king or a queen or a flannel quilt or a minky, something like that. So on the floor, and you can't see that, well, you can kind of see it. I have a floor bar on the back and one that's parallel with the left side of the machine. And in that floor bar is a corner bracket. Uh, there are three of them, and that's what the poles are sticking out of. And as we kind of go through this, I have some of those pieces that I can show you on camera so you can see a little closer what they look like. But I have set this up with the three poles. Notice I have a short one in the front. You get two short poles and the six are taller. And I suggest that you cut them to fit your needs. You'll have to use the weightless quilter, experiment with it a little bit for your sewing space and your machine, and then cut them to fit. If they're too tall, you'll notice you have tension on your quilt. Here, let's take a look. So I have a quilt that is, uh, has been started. Actually, it's almost finished. So let's open that up. It's a really pretty colorful quilt. And I'm going to place this on my machine. Let me see what's the right side up, okay. So I've already attached my metal frame of my nine and a half by 14 to the machine. And I actually have my design already selected on the screen. And this is the design that I'm going to stitch, which is just a big swirly, pretty design. And that's actually from our friends, uh, uh, Christine Connor over at Amelia Scott Designs, Edge to Edge Quilting. And now I'm just gonna feed the edge of the quilt underneath the foot and just not worry about it. Just put that under there. And then I'm gonna attach the back pole to the clamp, the fabric clamp, and the other corner also. And you just, you know, take a little bit of time, do it the right way. And then I'll place this one here. And then I can fuss with placement. So I would take my template and I would position that on my quilt. Now, I'm gonna cheat here. We're not actually, we're not gonna have thread and we're not gonna have needles, but I'm just gonna show you what I would do. Like for instance, here I can just place my template right where I want it. It's actually positioned directly over a previously stitched design. So this tells me the center of my design. So I know where I want to center my needle. I can use the, this long crosshair as a guide to make sure I'm parallel with my seams. And I'm not perfectly parallel, but you know, I could spend time doing that. And then I just kind of move the quilt to center that needle over the template. And then I take my magnetic frame, the top, and notice if you have a metal bottom uh, table, <laughs> like I do, a leg, I can just snap that metal frame right to it. This is our hoop guard. Now hoop guard is going to keep that bulk roll out of position. So um, I just snap that into place. And now I'm going to attach the quilt, I mean the, the top frame to the bottom. And if you can see, I'm really crooked. It, this template is now going this way. So easy to fix. I just lift that top frame, reposition my fabric, you know, and you know, you're going to do this 50 times. So the very first hooping, you're going to be so precise. And then when you get to hooping number 20, you're not going to be as precise anymore. And that's okay. So I could move my, ne my needle over to uh, the center of my design. And how do I do that? I want to be in layout and move and then just jog over there. There we go. And say, okay, then I'm gonna lift my presser foot and peel that template back. And then I just store that on the quilt because that is a print and stick target template paper that is uh, sticky, it's tacky. And I've used just this one template to do that entire quilt. And then, you know, it's, I love it, it's wonderful, great stuff. So we're just gonna let that stitch and we're gonna show you, uh, we'll kind of back up a little bit, give you a better view. So you can see how that wide angle shot, see how the quilt just moves and see how the weightless quilter moves with it. 
So you can see that front pole is really flexing as where the poles in the back are just standing there holding it. It's kind of like having three of your girlfriends hold your quilt while you quilt. And it works the very same if it was a free motion quilting, walking foot, stitch regulator, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it's really wonderful. Uh, and Misha, you use IKEA table rooms, uh, IKEA tables for your sewing table. You know, actually this table here that I'm using in this image is an IKEA table and it's an adjustable height. Um, you know, just they have them in electric, but they also have it with um, a hand crank that you can just raise it. And that's what I do. So you, uh, Helene wants to know, you do not have to pull the thread through before start stitching. So the back doesn't have a knot at each starting point. Well, that's a really great question. And Helene, if you are um, quite an experienced quilter, you that may um, be a problem for you. I can tell you on my baby lock machines, I don't do that. There is a tie on and a tie off on, on every hooping, but there's a wrong side and a right side of every quilt. And if it really kind of bothers you that much, use a busy back. But I, we can take this off after a little while in the show, and I'll let you look at the back of the quilt under a tight camera. And let's see, Sherry Picarell, will this work with the 8x8? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it'll work with any, any monster hoop. And, and it will even work with a standard hoop. You're just not going to want to do your project with a standard hoop because you're not going to want to have to re-hoop. See, I, in order to advance the fabric to the next uh, embroidery design, I'm not going to take the quilt off the machine. So when this stops stitching, we'll go back over there and uh, I will show you how we'll advance the quilt by leaving that bottom frame in place. Okay, and Misha, she said, this might be a dumb question. There's no dumb questions. Do you use clear thread on top for an embroidered top? It's not a dumb question. Many people do use a monofilament thread. They come in two colors. They come in smoke and clear. And so the smoke you would use on dark fabrics and the clear on light fabrics. But many quilters like their thread to enhance the quilt. And they will select a colored thread that either um, contrast or blends with the fabric. That's really up to you. Now, if you like, if you don't want to see the thread, you just want to add texture, then go the monofilament way uh, because then you, you know, you always have an ample supply, right? You could do it in the needle and the bobbin. Now, winding a bobbin of a monofilament thread can be a little tricky because a monofilament thread can stretch during the bobbin winding process. But I've had good success with it, but gee, I love, you know, pretty colored thread. In fact, in this one, I'm using our Sunset, which is a, a beautiful variegated thread. It's just so pretty. Uh, we probably can't see it that well, but it's yellow and kind of a neon green and then a, a pretty bright orange. So that's really fun. Okay, so let's head back over and I can show you how to um, advance the quilt. So what I do is I lift my bottom frame and well, actually I, I don't do it like that. I do it like this and I lift it right over and I just leave it in position here. And then I will advance my fabric by putting my template in place. And you know, I would pay attention to the placement, make sure that I'm parallel with the seams or whatever I'm trying to accomplish, right? Every quilt is different. Now you'll notice, I have this template pretty far close to the edge so I, of the quilt. So I'm going to drop that back handle. We'll just let that go. And now when I'm stitching, I don't have to worry. Uh, let's go ahead and get this in the center. Mm, pardon me. It's hard to think on camera, right? Okay. So now I'm just going to lift that and get this uh, positioning just where I want it, and now I'm ready to stitch, okay? And we uh, certainly would remove that template. You know, if you ever stitch through a template, you'll only do that once, right? Okay, now remember, we don't have needles. I mean, we don't have uh, a needle or a thread in that, so you're not actually gonna see thread applying. 
And then heartfelt creative. You want to know, can you use the sticky hoop? I would not use the sticky hoop on a quilt because you're not going to be able to remove that stabilizer. Um, our sticky hoop comes with tearaway sticky adhesive stabilizer, which is permanent and stays on the back of a quilt. You could cut water soluble stabilizer, water soluble stabilizer like our adhesive sew and wash to apply to the back of a, a sticky hoop. But I, I think that would be a very expensive process. Uh, I, I think you're better off getting a monster hoop that would hold the top. So, yeah. And let's see, A. McCarthy. She says she uses the weightless quilter when she sews big drapery panels and banner curtains and shower curtains. And you know what? I love it for AIM. Those are great tasks to use for sure. But um, I, I use it for binding. I love binding using it for binding because that's the last part of the quilt, right? It's, you know, you've already probably put the label on and the very last thing that you're doing is binding. And that's so annoying to have all that bulk of quilt that you're trying to feed through the sewing machine. So I use it for that. And uh, let's see, Dawn wants to know, why am I using a template instead of using the projector to line up? Well, the, the projector on this machine would be a good option for sure. It is the only machine, you know, in the baby lock line that has the projector, I believe. So th there would be a limited uh, technique for all the people that are watching today, but it would work and, and it does work beautifully. It most certainly does work beautifully for that. Okay, let's see. Um, Will this work? Yeah. Let, mm -hmm. Do you have to pull the thread? Oh, when you use a koala cabinet. Okay. So let's go ahead and take a look at some layouts of how we uh, can lay out the weightless quilter. So with that being said, so like what I'm working on right now, oh, let me see if I can, why are you, let me see if I can get rid of that comment so you can see a little bit clearer. Sorry, folks. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so this is the, the layout that you just saw. That's what my machine is doing. That black kind of weird circle oval there is uh, mimicking the chair. And of course the machine is the white bar and the hoop and then the weightless quiller itself. The little white boxes are the floor brackets, which are right here. So super easy to assemble. Here's the two holes for our poles, one skinny, one larger. And our floor bars it just slide right into these openings. And you know, so it works like this. No tools are required. The metal floor bar slips in here, and then you just put this thumb screw right into that opening, and uh, it has a threaded hole on the floor bar so it will stay in place. But in fact, it, I don't even use the, the, the thumb screws anymore. It, it's a nice, pretty nice tight fit, so I don't even use them anymore but they're there for you. Okay, uh, so let's see. So that's the layout on the floor for what I just, uh, the machine you just saw. And now this is a much larger table. So this is like an eight foot folding table, that kind of machine, that kind of table. So now you'll notice that the floor bar on the left slides underneath the table. And, uh, you know, because you, you, probably won't want it to be that far away from the hoop itself because you really want to keep the weightless quilter centered behind the hoop pretty much you know pretty much it, there's not a lot of rules you'll see once you get it on the weightless quilter it just swings and does its own thing it's pretty cool okay now if you have a koala cabinet Many of them, uh, well, I can't swear on this, but lots of sewing machine furniture is flush to the floor. And so then your floor bars would surround your koala cabinet. Now the cross section of the floor bar is a three quarters in height. So if you have that much clearance underneath your sewing furniture, then you could slide the floor bar underneath your sewing furniture. Now for free motion, for those of you who love the, like the baby lock tiara or the new handy quilter moxie that just came out, this is how you would sit at the machine. Now, instead of facing your machine where it extends, you know, the needle right in front of you and the head of the machine to the right on a sit down machine, you sit at the needle 
and the machine extends beyond your face, like directly in front of you. So, and you guide the fabric underneath the needle in that fashion. So I would suggest that you use the three floor bars, one in the back and two on each side. And I would also suggest that you cut the bar, the uh, flex poles, practically the same height as your table. Because if they're too tall, now remember your quilt has to go around that machine head, right? If you can picture that it, with the way this illustration is. So your quilt is kind of like splayed out in around the back of the machine. So if your bars are too high, you know, it's just too much tension. So cut them to be about the same height, maybe two, three inches taller than your uh, table. And that will allow you to do a very large quilt in a small footprint without um, you, the need of extension tables that come with, or you know, can be an additional purchase with lots of those machines. So uh, anyway, super fun, huh? Okay, let's, um, let's go and take another look at that quilt. And, and I want to show you how I would do the middle of the quilt. So I'm just going to roll this over. I'm going to come down here a little bit. And you may find that when you want to do the other half of the, of the quilt, that it's best to rotate the quilt. So I'm just kind of fussing with this, you know, and this is a job, right? I mean, it's definitely a job. You're, this isn't something that you're going to do in an, oh, I keep thinking that's in the center and it's not in the center. I, I, uh, I thought I was being really tricky here and loaded designs on top of each other and then forgot to hit the monochromatic button. Okay, so now I'm in this position. So I'm gonna drop the quilt from the front bar and I'm gonna reattach it to that pole in the back. Now it looks to you like, oh, there's a lot of rearranging. Well, that's not really true. Now remember a quilt like this is gonna take about 50 hoopings. And uh, because of that, you're going to work a section at a time. Oh, let's go ahead and pull that off. You're gonna work a section at a time. So I might literally do like five or six hoopings in the same area of the quilt. And I won't have to drop poles or release the fabric from a pole, but it, it's, it, you know, it's a good idea to do the right half of the quilt in this fashion. And then after that is complete, you flip the quilt and rotate it, rotate your embroidery design, and then quilt the other half of the quilt because that will allow you to eliminate a huge roll between the hoop and the head of the machine. Now, you know, I have, I have hoop guard on there, which I can show you. Um, maybe let's just fill the screen with that machine screen. And you saw earlier in the program where I attached that to the monster hoop. So I'll just show you here. Yeah, Christina Cunningham, she's, so it just snaps right on like that. You can't see, let's see. This is probably the best way to do that. So we snap it on, but you always wanna make, oh, sorry. You always wanna make sure that it is, my goodness, that it is to the right of the needle. You don't want this hoop guard over by the needle, right? We, we, you want it to the right side of the hoop so that it doesn't interfere with the levers or any of that. It's been engineered to clear that needle bar. And let's see, Christina Cunningham, you said, yeah, the biggest quilt you finished was 75 by 80. And it was a job. It is a job for sure without a long arm. Well, even with a long arm, it's a big job. But you know, you, you can do it on your way. I mean, with the weightless quilter, I love doing this. I love doing this. Yeah, it's so fun. You know, it's just a great sense of accomplishment because I could go to my local quilt shop, which I love, which is Quilt Country in Louisville, Texas. It's one of the prettiest quilt shops in Texas for sure. And they have a great long arm serve there that I could drop quilts off, but you know, I, I like to finish them. I like to put that final touch on, 
you know, as I make the quilt and I think of the person that's going to receive that quilt, you know, part of that love that I pour into it is in the finishing. So, you know, that's important to me and I'm sure it is for you. Um, let's see. Yeah. Do I recommend the weightless quilter over the shorty? I would have to say, yes, I do. Uh huh. Yes, I do at this time. And then uh, Nancy Taylor, does the hoop card fit the HV machines? The hoop card fits our hoops. It is designed to be used with Snap Hoop Monster for all of our Snap Hoop Monsters, all brands that we make. It is not designed to work with anybody else's hoops. So, and what is the purpose of the hoop card? Okay, let's go over and take a closer look. And I'll see if I can't pull this down a little bit so you can see. Oh, maybe Sam, maybe do the wide angle, Sam, so they can see. But right here, I have this bulk. And without this hoop guard, this could happen so easy. And that happens when you absolutely fall in love with the quilt. Well, you already are in love with the quilt by the time you get to this stage. This is just heartbreaking when the quilt roll falls into the sewing field and you have turned around for a moment and you stitch all that together. Well, hoop guard allows you to snap that in place and then it creates that barrier and it's not going to fall through. And so I have it forward right now so you can see, but normally it's in the center of the hoop, right around that center of the hoop so that it holds that quilt roll back on, you know, the whole length of the hoop. And that is brilliant. I mean, that when I invented that, I was like, yeah, that's the easiest way to handle that problem because that's a big problem. Now, I will tell you, if you're going to buy hoop guard, it is on back order, Wendy. Hanson, it is on back order, but it's going, supposedly coming in next week. And, you know, we're so grateful that for your patience with these products. You, this COVID period has just been quite, um, it's a difficult time for everyone, as you know. And, uh, you know, UPS's business is up 65%. All shipping, all, everything is backlogged like you can't believe. It's not so much, you know, that it's not in our warehouse. We just can't get it here, you know? So anyway, coming soon, coming soon. Yeah. Oh, let's see. And you, Debbie, you have a big hubby. He's very tall. So you finished at 140 by 140. Wow. Wow. I hope he appreciates what you did because that is one large quilt. Absolutely. And Kathy Winks, you agree. You are a start to finish kind of gal. Yeah, I agree. I like to do that. You know, you kind of feel like you're cheating if you, uh, you know, give it, hand it off to someone else, right? Oh, uh, Betty, you like the hoop guards? Let's see. Uh, they've been a lifesaver several times, right? And, you know, frankly, we don't really know how often they are a lifesaver because when you use it, you don't have any problems. So you don't know how many times it has really saved uh, your problem. So let's see, if you cut the, the legs for your domestic machine, then you would not be able to use them on your embroidery machine. Well, not necessarily. Um, you know, you don't really need the poles to be that tall. We, we did, you know, I kind of think that um, 48 inches is probably as tall as you really need. But some people that have positioned their embroidery machine on a stand-up unit and they, they don't want to sit at their machine. So that's why we have the taller poles. But you could also purchase extra poles. It's a part that we can sell here so that you could save them. Um, I mean, you could purchase them extra ones. But I've never been unhappy when I cut a pole. And when I cut them, I mean, the, the shortest I'm going to cut them are like 35 inches. So yeah, it's pretty good. Okay, let's see. And what are the templates called? The templates are print and stick target template paper. And it's paper that goes into your printer and you print out the embroidery design with a crosshair. Now, if you are not uh, a avid software user and you don't, or you don't use software at all, we do have a free software program called Embroidery Toolshed that allows you to resize and any embroidery design and also print a template of that embroidery design. So that's a free program you can download and you can open any of your quilting designs in there and print a crosshair, you know, on that template, which is awesome. 
And Carol, will this work on a Bernina machine? Oh, absolutely. Those Bernina machines are beautiful. I just, you know, they stitch such gorgeous quilting designs. So yes, the weightless quilter is a very uh, good companion to a Bernina machine along with our snap hoop monsters. And will snap hoop monster fit all HV machines? Well, you would have to check our compatibility chart. We make four um, Husqvarna Viking uh, monster hoops, 120 by 120. 260 by 200, 200 by 200, and 200 by 360, I believe. So they are all, uh, you can find that in our compatibility chart. And also, uh, let's see. And Christina Cunningham, you want to ask Judy, how many hoopings was that? Yeah, really. Well, if I'm like Judy, I don't count. <laughs> I don't, after a while, I don't count. I do a little math, you know, to, to, so I know time-wise and so forth. And I, it also helps, well, that's a whole nother lesson, but that, uh, si that helps me um, size my embroidery design. So I know it's going to fit the width of my quilt and then how many repeats I'll need to fill the height. But that's a whole nother class and we're not gonna do that today. Let's see. Uh, Misha, you say there's problems with our MVP file. All right, we'll look into that. Thanks for bringing that to our attention. Um, Let's see, Isabel Brian, you never quilted a large quilt. Well, lose your fear because if you can do a small thing, you can do a large thing. The whole idea is maintaining the weight of that quilt. And Carol Lombard, can you use a weightless quilter around the 10 needle? You can use the weightless quilter around a uh, 10 needle, but you know, again, you're going to have to get that quilt all that bulk, you know, around that head of the machine, there's not that much opening in a 10 needle between the sewing field and the curve of the head. So if you are already comfortable doing, you know, quilting on your 10 needle, then the weightless quilter would be a wonderful addition for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Do, you, do we have a thread conversion chart? Yes. In uh, the embroidery tool shed, we convert to almost every manufacturer that I'm aware of thread brand. So you just bring up your design and if it's a Madeira color palette and you wanna to switch to exquisite, you just can do that with uh, the click of a button. It'll give you all the colors in that appropriate brand. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've been chatting a long time. Any other questions before we move on to the November door? What do you think? Should we do it? Are you ready? Let me see. So let me make sure there's no, uh, okay. You need more practice on your 10 needle. Yeah, don't we all? But you know, I'm actually gonna be getting better at my 10 needle. Okay, so as you know, we had, oh, these aren't in order. Oh boy. Well, this is May, June, July, and August, and uh, October, September and October, and here, is November. Isn't it cute? Isn't it so cute? Oh gosh, I love it. I love it. It's a barn. It has hay in the loft. It has a quilt barn block, a barn quilt, and it has a weather vane. But in the foreground, it's really empty. It has just a little bit of grass that flanks each door. I mean the door. So imagine what you could put under there, some animals, um, maybe a tractor, maybe chickens. They are animals, but anyway, super fun, huh? Let's see, Kirsten Swanson says, I love a good barn. Yeah, who doesn't, right? You know, I didn't grow up near a barn, but I grew up at the Jersey Shore. So um, we didn't have, we don't have any farms on that little island, farms inland for sure. And it really wasn't until I got to be friendly with Nancy Zeman that I learned anything about farming. And uh, it was, you know, just wonderful to learn about that. And then I married a wonderful man from uh, Wisconsin who's also taught me an awful lot about farming. And, you know, I grew up, uh, my father was a, a a personal pilot and he loved to fly and he had a beautiful um, steerman that he restored himself. So I have these wonderful childhood memories of flying in an open cockpit airplane and uh, over, you know, farmland. 
where you would see these patches, right? It's like a patchwork quilt and some are you know, round and rectangles and square and all that. And so it wasn't until I was married, like, you know, my late 40s that I found out that those circles are because of irrigation. I was so horrified that I didn't know that when I found that out. So, oh my, always something to learn, right? And all you folks who just can't wait to see what OML embroidery is going to come up with for the mini designs, I'm sure they are going to have uh, beautiful, beautiful minis to add. And uh, the Garden State, right. Carolyn Bard, you know, so many people think New Jersey looks like the opening scene of The Sopranos. Well, that's a patch of New Jersey, but it is called the Garden State. And it's one very pretty state. So let's take a look at how we actually are going to make this door. So the first thing you're going to do is stitch that, uh, you're going to hoop cutaway stabilizer and stitch color one, which is the tack down of the batting and also some notches that indicate where the sky and the barn fabric will wind up, you know, place, being placed. So trim that batting before the next step if you are making standalone doors, and then cover the sky area above that notch, that first notch, with a sky fabric and stitch that tack down, and then trim it away just under at the lower edge of the sky because you know you wanna allow space for the barn to come in. Notice we have that excess seam allowance outside of the outline, and that's helpful later on when we are turning. Next, you'll cover that open area with the barn fabric. And I used a Moda grunge that had that kind of weathered look, just perfect for the side of a barn. And then your next colors are gonna stitch all these black details. And they look a little funky right there until you uh, get the frame on. And then you'll trim that bottom, you know, and uh, this was very poor trimming, but on the bottom, you do wanna leave at least a quarter inch because we're gonna add some grass. So uh, leave some excess fabric beyond that bottom edge of the barn and then place your grass fabric strip right sides together, making sure that a, a, at least a quarter inch of it is extended below the edge of the barn stitching and then stitch that seam and then pull that down and stitch the next color which will tack it in place. And then it's time to move on to the hayloft. So that black area that you see is actually complex fill. It's stitched, it is not applique. And um, you'll stitch that and then you'll stitch the hay and the black details of the hay, which just give it a little definition. And you know, if you're learning to digitize along uh, or you know, really exploring this, and like I'm getting to be a much better digitizer as I create these doors. I've learned so much. Like as you stitch this, take a good look at the hay and how that stitches out. You know, I, I learned if you make three different blocks and change the direction, it looks more realistic. So then we're going to add all of our framing. So there's no applique outside of the barn itself. You know, it's just uh, all the details are added with thread instead of fabric, which I thought was really fun. And then you will add your barn uh, quilt at the top of the barn. And then finally finish with the weather vane. And also when it stitches the weather vane, it's going to stitch that black line, the roof shingles right along the top. So um, that's the final color. And then it also does door handles. Next thing you're gonna do is add those hanging tabs. And you know, I had heard a comment recently, someone uh, sent in to our help desk that she thought that the tabs were too big. And you know, maybe so, huh? What do you think? The tabs too big? When you make them, do you make tiny skinny little tabs? Let me know in the comments. And so we can, I, I can learn from you. And as we move forward into 2021, we make sure we're all doing um, the same look that we enjoy. Okay, and then we're going to add our backing fabric right on top of the quilt block, right side down, right? Backing fabric right side down, stitch the next color, which is going to leave an outline, an opening in that outline. And remember, this is a two-ply run, so it's going to go around twice to give you a nice firm hold. And then when you take it out of the hoop, you're going to trim um, 
along all the edges and trim the corners diagonally so you get a nice sharp corner. And I, at this point, I also fold back the seam allowance on the back and the front. And I press that before I turn it and it makes it easier to, to um, edge stitch it later on. Let's see. And yeah, many of you are saying um, that you make the tabs uh, that my tabs are too big, you make them a little longer. Alicia, you make a 5.5 inch wide one tab. I like that. That's a good idea. It's probably a little tricky to get it on the um, on, on the opening, you know, but that's okay because it just has that one little slit in the center. Where is it? There we go. Uh, you know what, you know what I'm talking about. So anyway, but okay, that's good. And you know, A. McCarthy last week, she gave me her doors uh, because we showed them on the show and uh, her tabs are beautiful. And in fact, she finishes hers completely different. So we'll have to have her back and find out how she does it. She binds to the front. She's really talented. Let's see. Let me see along with the back and not separately. Uh, Barbara Gidding, she says the side, they need to be stitched along with the back and not separately. Eh, maybe so. I don't know. I, you know, I like living dangerously. I'm sorry. No, I'm only kidding. It's probably a good point that tape them down, cover with the um, backing fabric, and then it wouldn't get caught. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. Um, I, I tend to sit at my machine at that point, like with the pencil, the end, and just keep the tabs in place. So, and you, and Heartfelt Creative, you bind to the front also. Okay, that's cool. Okay, so there is our barn. Isn't he cute? I love him. I'm so proud of him. I really had a lot of fun digitizing that. And you could add snow, you know, you could add snow for sure. I mean, we don't have, it's not winter quite here yet. So anyway. Okay, well, next week, we're going to talk uh, a little bit more about software. We have some other topics. So if you have questions um, about the weightless quilter, or monster hoop or hoop guard, you know, please put them in the comments now and um, I'll be happy to answer them. But wasn't that fun? I hope you get your quilts done in time for Christmas, right? Many of you are making quilts for Christmas because, you know, that's such a special gift. Yeah. And Risa, you like the quilt block on the barn. I know barn quilts are just so cool. It's just so enjoyable to drive through the countryside and see a barn with a quilt um, barn on, you know, barn quilt on it. And hoop guard for all hoops. Well, we do have quilt, uh, hoop guards for standard hoops. They don't really apply to quilting. They're more for onesies and t-shirts and that type of thing. And then they go in standard hoops. So anyway. Okay, well, thanks, folks, for joining me. It was really fun to have you here today. And I look forward to seeing you here next week at 1 o'clock. And we'll pick up where we left off. Thanks for watching.